Yep. It's very rare that a song peaks on the charts where it bookends two different decades. It ends one and starts another one, where it seems like uh, the feeling of the song itself is both looking back at that decade and looking forward to the new one. Up next, a song that did just that, and years later, it's still a part of our culture. Next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you used to buy records at the store, cassettes and CDs, or if you still do, this is your place. Subscribe below right now to be a part of our daily celebration of the rock and roll era. And look for us on Patreon to become an insider for more content. It's time for another edition of our series, Revelations, where featured artists reveal rare stories about their greatest songs and albums. On this particular installment of Revelations, we get the straight story of a song that was the last number one song in the 1970s. Then it fell to number two in the first week of the 80s, only to regain the top spot in the second week of the new decade. Escape Pina Colada song by the ultra multi-talented Rupert Holmes. If you like Pina Colada, get caught in the rain. Depending on who you speak to, Escape could be an insightful look at the winding down of the excess of the 70s, or a look into the future, you know, the 80s where health became a priority. I've heard people lay claim to it as a 70s hit, just as many have claimed it as an 80s classic. It undoubtedly has a, just a strange aura around it. It seems to hypnotize you as a listener. And the story of how Rupert Holmes created it is just incredible, really. I was lucky enough to have a long-ranging interview with him about this on a recent Zoom session. I'll tell you what, Rupert Holmes is such a talent. He is a Tony Award-winning playwright, a television writer, and a novelist. This one is a can't miss. Now, as we go into this interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. I'm wearing my thinner blue pair today. You can actually go to the Zenny website, design your own pair, have them delivered right to your door, all you do is go to zenny.com, choose your style, do a 3D virtual try on put in your prescription, and they deliver them to your door. Go to zenny.com and check it out. Here's Rupert with the song. In 1979, you released your fifth studio album, Partners in Crime, and from that breakthrough album came the mega smash, Escape, the Pina Colada song. If you like Pina Colada, Last song to hit number one, on the Billboard Hot 100 in the 70s. Could have been the first in the 80s, but there was a Casey came in for one week there. I've made that mistake many times of thinking it was the first number one of the 80s as well. That whole issue about, was it the last number one record of the 70s and the first of the 80s? Uh, there were three trade papers at that time, Cashbox, Record World, and Billboard. In Record World and Billboard, it remained number one for the first week. There are some who think that Casey and the Sunshine Band, they were on a powerful label. They were on, I think, Atco, which was part of Atlantic. Atlantic Records, big label. And I was on a label that had just gone out of business, Infinity Records. The record was taken up by MCA. But for that period of time, I the label was out of business. And there are some people God forbid I would say that Billboard was suspect in any way, but there was a rumor going around that I was told that someone got to the right person and paid the right amount of money and got them for that one week to flip the chart so that Atlantic would have the number one, the first number one record of the 80s. And interestingly enough, the next week, Escape went right back to number one. So, so I'm just saying, and in the other two trades, it stayed number one. So it's not a complete, it's... It's, there's, a, there's some truth to the idea that, 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 uh, that, that I got to end and begin a decade in the number one slot, yeah. Yeah, and I like telling people that in some trade papers, I, um, I, had, uh, I was at the top of the charts for two decades without interruption. <laughs> I gotta tell you, Rupert, Escape was probably the first five or six songs that I remember hearing as a child. I was only four years old when that came out. Maybe even, no, I was probably only three. And I remember these few songs that were on the radio, Escape, Do That To Me One More Time, some of the Rock With You, Michael Jackson. The rock with you all night. Um, yeah, you know, the, the first songs you hear, 
I can remember the first songs I ever heard when I was like two and a half, three. It's like, can you remember? I, I wrote a TV series called Remember When, which was about uh, the golden age of radio. I wrote it for AMC. AMC's original series about life at a 1939 radio station, Remember When. It was set in 1939 in Pittsburgh, and I wrote an episode where part of the episode was about people tasting pizza for the first time. So the first songs you hear are sort of like that. You're saying, what is happening to me? I'm hearing notes and words and it's engraving itself in my brain. And every time I hear it, I feel good or I feel blue. I remember there was a song that was popular in England. I was born in England. It was the saddest Christmas song ever written. The saddest. It was called The Little Boy That Santa Claus Forgot. The boy that Santa Claus forgot. It was all about how Santa Claus forgot him. And he went back to last year's broken toys. And the last lines were even sadder. It went, I feel so sorry for that laddie. He hasn't got a daddy. He's the little boy. That's... Now, I didn't understand that him not having a daddy was the reason that Santa Claus forgot him. I just thought this was the unluckiest kid to walk the face of the earth. But it made such an impression on me that every time I heard it, I almost wanted to run to my room and hide from the song. The first few songs that you hear as a child, it really does mold your ears and your brain for, for pop music. And it started this love for the top 40 for me. And Professor Rock, what we've done is captured over 3,000 songs, a story behind 3,000 songs, almost 600 interviews, because a love for that, of the story behind the song. And Escape is such a cinematic song. As a kid, when I heard it and the first drum part and it goes in, it, it's exotic. It takes you away. Not only was it number one here, but it was also Australia, Canada, Japan. I love the song and I want to jump into it. Another story song that you wrote, and it could have been just relegated to being just a clever novelty song, but it ended up becoming like, a pop culture phenomenon. My kids love that song. People have really connected to this song over the years. And it's what I love about the song is, it's a story song is really in three acts. Every verse, it furthers the story and the cinematic vein that is through this song. And the placeholder title for the song I always read was People Need Other People. Tell me how that song came about. It's a long story. You got time for it? I've got time. Okay, all I've right. been waiting years to, to <laughs> ask about this. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's a complicated story. And again, it's one of those things where I made a couple of decisions in a, in a period of 10 seconds, and it changed the course of my life and that, that record. I was recording my fifth album, as I say, and I'd had some records. My previous album had had a record that started to climb the charts, and then that, that label went out of business. So I still hadn't had a real genuine hit. I, people... I, I did it well enough to keep being signed to labels, but this was my fifth LP. And I had a preponderance of ballads on the al album. Companions at a I needed some up-tempo songs. I had a song I'd always kind of liked. I liked the groove of it. It had started out being a kind of song I made up in my head. My office was on Fifth Avenue, and I looked out the window at, at uh, Fifth Avenue, and I noticed that there were nothing but Italian designer stores on the street. And I started humming a song that went, Fiorucci, baby, with your new Gucci shoes, Poochie Poochie, baby, Gucci G's, Gucci Goose. And, um, and it just kind of stayed with me. And I said, well, let me see if I can make that into a song. And I started to write a song that went, people need other people. I believe you will find something like that. And we recorded the cut. My great drummer, Leo Damien, on that album said, you know, this groove is such that I could use a second drummer on the record. Someone who will keep the basic groove so I can do more playing around on the toms and cymbals and do some, because it's got kind of a upside down backwards reggae feel to it. So we hired a second drummer for that one song. When you record a song, you usually do a take and then go into the control room to hear how it sounds. And sometimes you say, oh, you got to mic the tom-toms the closer or, or I don't like the way the piano is sounding. It's really a dry run. So we did one take of this song and I was at the piano. We recorded it uh, atop Radio City Music Hall on the seventh floor 
at a studio at that time called Plaza Sound, uh, right near Rockettes rehearsal room. And if you listen to the opening bars of the record, you can hear distantly my voice bleeding into the piano mic going, people. Because I'm singing, people need other people. And you can just hear that bleeding into the piano. We did the take and um, listened to it. And I said, well, that was pretty sloppy. I know we can do better than that. And I looked and the drummer, the other drummer, not Leo Damien, but the other drummer on the session was had sort of passed out on the couch. I have no idea why. And we obviously were not going to do another take that day because we had just lost one of our musicians. They, a friend got him into a taxi cab, took him home. And I thought, okay, so now what do I do? I listened that night to a rough mix of this track. We only had one take of this song. And I found 16 bars of it that were tight and good and had a nice pocket to it. And my guitarist, Dean Balin, had some nice little tight noodling. I talked it over with the engineer and co-producer of the album, Jim Boyer. And we did something that was very uncommon at that time, mainly because it was impossible to do physically. Now it is very standard, and you'll understand what we did when I tell you, and you'll understand what I mean by now it's a commonplace thing. But this is the analog era. We recorded on two-inch tape, and what we did is we duped off those 16 bars that were tight of this record, and then Jim Boyer edited together with a razor and tape all those pieces of tape until we had a four minute loop of just those 16 bars. Nowadays it's called looping and rap artists do it all the time. They, they sample some little part of a record and digitally they can loop it and make it repeat itself forever. But we did it manually with this reel of tape. So now what do I have? I have a track that has a pretty good rhythm feel to it, but the song I recorded won't fit that track. People need other people who won't fit with that because people need other people at a chorus and this and that. So now I have to write a song to this existing track. And I realize it better be a story song. And luckily, that's my specialty. But I think it better be a really intriguing story because the music is going to have a kind of repetitive quality to it. Because the chorus is going to be built on the same track that the verse is built on. So I have to write a story song. So now it's the night before our last day of recording is booked in Plaza Sound. So I have to sing this record. I have to sing this song that I have not yet written, for which I have a track, um, the next day at 10 a.m. And I don't have a song. And I'm sitting at my kitchen table, and I look across the table, and I see the Village Voice is there, and it has all these personal columns on the back of it. And it's all columns about people saying, I am attractive and beautiful and love fun and like going on right contact me at this number and i think if all these people are so wonderful as they say why do they have to advertise can't they just walk down the street and say have you noticed how wonderful i am i thought all right okay be fair though be fair maybe they want this adventure of meeting someone who they don't know and not knowing quite what to expect and 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 not being something prosaic and humdrum um, and I thought, okay, now if you, I, most of the time when I write a story song, I say, okay, if you were in that situation that you've just invented, what would then probably happen? So that it feels like it's really happening to me. So I thought, what would happen to you if you ever answered one of those ads? And I started to write this lyric. And the lyric, the chorus began, if you like Humphrey Bogart and getting caught in the rain. Is looking at you, kid. I go to the studio the next day. So I'm about to record this song. My guitar player, Dean Balin, is with me in the studio because whatever I do at, when I'm done vocally, we're now going to have to also create some stuff to fill the instrumental breaks in this empty track that we have, this very bare track. So he's with me, ready to go to work with me. And I thought, you know, this is a story song with a twist ending. And what I was nervous about was that you could see the twist coming too soon. And I worried about that. So I said to him, and I said to the engineer, Eric uh, Block, I'm gonna sing the song all the way through. 
If I make a mistake, don't stop tape. Keep rolling. I'm just going to keep going without stopping because I want to see if Dean, listening in real time, can guess the ending of the song before I get there. So it's kind of a challenge. And I said, Dean, you got to pay attention to this lyric like you never paid attention before. Okay? Don't just say it's nice to listen to the story and tell me if you get there ahead of me. So now I'm going to sing the song, and we've decided I will sing it in one take. And it doesn't matter how sloppy it is or any, or if I make mistakes, I'm still going to keep pressing forward. I have this lyric that I've typed out. I have never actually sung the song out loud. I've only read it out loud. But I've never sung it to the track. And I look at the lyric, and it says, if you like Humphrey Bogart, and I say, just as I'm about to sing it, I think, you know, Humphrey Bogart is a black and white image. That's noir. I said, this, this couple in the, in the story, they're not noir. They're looking for something. They want escape. They, they, they want to go to the islands. They, 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 what if, and I thought about the fact that when you go on a vacation to the Caribbean, the first day you're on the beach, you would never order a Budweiser. You, because you're on vacation. You want to order something that comes in a hollow dot pineapple, or if it could be blue with parasols, and that, that would be great. What are those drinks? What are the escape drinks? Mai Tai, daiquiri, pina colada. I had never had a pina colada in my entire life. And I said, if you like Humphrey Bogart, no. If you like pina, I added an extra eighth note and went, if you like pina coladas, I said, oh, that actually works pretty well. Pina colada. So that's what I'll do. If you like pina coladas, get and I didn't even bother to change the lyric on the stand. I just knew that every time it said, if you like Humphrey Bogart, I would say pina coladas. I sang the song and here's what I, I really didn't think about this much until recent years. The song, the vocal that you hear on that record is the first time I ever sang the song. And you hear me having the fun of discovering the song. If you're not into yoga, if you have half a brain. And because I had never checked the song against the track, I had a couple of moments, some bumpy moments, where I thought, I've got too many syllables here. So I had to do things like go, I've got to meet you by tomorrow noon. And that's because I suddenly realized I had too many syllables and I had to cram them all in. Or in one case, I realized I had too few. And I said, I am into champagne. I am into champagne. Stretching them out. And what you're hearing is me having the fun and excitement and exuberance of telling a joke for the first time to my guitar player, Dean Bale, basically, to see if he gets the punchline before I get to it. When I finished the vocal, I went into the control room. I said, did you get the, did you see it coming? He said, no, I didn't. I really didn't see it coming. I said, okay, look, I said, that's just a scratch vocal. That's a reference vocal. It's sloppy. I didn't do a good job with it, but we'll go back to it. Let's make the, let's work on the instrumental break now. And, and this is the part that I didn't fully think through until a couple of years ago. So if I had said, if you like Humphrey Bogart, when we got to the instrumental break, I would have wanted to add like a tenor sax, a lonely, moody tenor sax or something. But I had, no, I had conjured up this idea of the islands and this pina coladas. I said, this break that we do, this instrumental break, it's got to be like a mini vacation. It's got to sound like we're in the islands. The well, first thing we did was this line. Da, 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 but it had to have a soaring sound to it. Really above the clouds. Then I had him add a sliding guitar, like a Hawaiian guitar. Da, 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 as if it's like a, what you hear at a luau. Okay, then I added some flutes on a, on a synthesizer. I added a little kind of alto flute parts to kind of make it sound uh, kind of ethereal. And uh, then I got my synthesizer to make the sound of surf. And I rolled some surf across the record in the middle of the instrumental break. So if you listen carefully, you'll hear da 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 like that. And pretty soon we had this very, very lustrous and 
kind of Martin Denny Paradise Hawaiian style. And basically, I realized had I kept the words Humphrey Bogart, I would never have made that break. The break was inspired by that decision I made in 10 seconds before I sang the song to not say Humphrey Bogart and to say Pina Colada. And it sends terror down my spine to think if you hadn't made a Pina Colada in that uh, impulsively, that happened, that decision happened, you wouldn't have made that break. The record wouldn't have been as entertaining. What happens in the song is that you get these three little, you, I was very pleased that you said the story's kind of been three acts. In between those three acts are three little vacations that you get orally. And then you get back to the narrator and the narrator is having, having the fun of telling the story for the first time. Where we'll plan our escape. One of the things that you said in an interview that I read that really resonated with me is one of the reasons that you liked writing Escape was even though it's a lighthearted song, it has a point of view and a suggestion that we dispose of relationships too easily. And I yeah. always thought that was really insightful. Unfortunately, um, sometimes we're too quick to think that there's something better in store for us rather than investigating and investing in the relationship you're already in. That was sort of what this escape, the Pina Colada song, is really about two people who are both looking for things in a relationship that they think the other can't provide or doesn't want to provide or that they have to go somewhere else for it. And yet the fact that they both have equal yearnings, without trying to turn it into some kind of profound pamphlet here, it, it, does, it does have a point of view. And it is about relationships and maybe us discarding them too quickly in today's disposable society. Now, when I went to do the good vocal, to sing it properly, after we created this guitar break section, I found I couldn't get the energy and the exuberance that I had when I had sung it that first time. I said, well, you know what? This is never going to be a single or anything like that. This is just a song I need to keep uh, some up-tempo material on the album. So I said, you know what? We'll just let it fly out there, imperfect as it is, warts and all. And I said, oh, what I'll do is I, I'll, I'll add some harmony. I'll put my own vocal and sing um, a harmony in the chorus. The first chorus will have a harmony. The, th the third chorus, I'll add a, a really high harmony at the, at the end kind of like what the searchers did on needles and pins which was one of my favorite records of all time i'll add some like three part with one of the harmony parts being way up in the stratosphere i'll have to scream to do it and that was the record and all of those things going from having to make a record out of 16 bars of usable music having to discard the song that was supposed to be, having to write uh, a story song that would be like an O. Henry story with a trick ending, merely to distract from the fact that there is a repetitiveness to the song, which is probably one of the reasons it was a hit, is because it's you hear it a lot on a first listening. You get a lot of that chorus. And then changing the lyric, coming up with the lyric on the, the night before, going to the studio, never having sung it, with all that energy, changing the word, then changing the instrument, uh, making the instrumental break reflect what it was. And then finally, the fact that I called the song Escape and my record label came to me and said, we're putting it out as a single. I said, no, 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 the single is him. Him is the hit. They said, our guys think this is it. And they said, and we're getting great response, but we have a problem. You called the song Escape, and everyone's asking for the song about the pina coladas. So do you mind if we call it Escape, parenthesis, the pina colada song? I still, to this day, don't know if I made the right decision, but they said, it's otherwise we're going to get no momentum. We're getting a lot of airplay, but people are going to record stores and saying, I want that song about the pina, well, it's the pina colada song. So all of that went into the making of this one song that absolutely completely changed the course of my life and is still having an effect on it some 40 years later and it it's a miraculous to me that i meet kids who who their parents weren't born when the song was a hit and they know the song they know the song it wasn't called yacht rock until 10 years ago first you make the music 
And and then 10 years, 15 years, 20 years later, someone figures, gives it a name, you know? But Yacht Rock, I mean, it's one of probably <laughs> one of the five mandatory songs for Yacht Rock, along with Sailing, Christopher Cross. Sailing takes me away. This is it. What a Fool Believes, all that stuff came out around the same time. It's a lifestyle, really. Um, Yeah, I think Jimmy uh, Jimmy Fallon seems to be very taken with, so I wrote to the paper. So I wrote to the paper. (laughs) I noticed when he sings the Pina Colada song, I think he really, that's the line I think he most enjoys singing. He sang it a couple times though. To the paper, what'd you take out? To get a personal act. Are you somebody's poem? Song, like we said, has been used so much in pop culture. Shrek. If you like me, you can <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy. Goldberg. The love that you've looked for. Right, right to, to me and escape. escape. Grown ups. If you're not into yoga, if you have half a brain. Deadpool 2 recently. Yeah. Living with yourself. If you like pina coladas. Yeah, there's a, it's a huge list. It's a huge list. I, 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 I have to, like, I don't have the list with me, but it's like, there's like 30 movies. Nice guys. Like a worn out recording. American Splendor. You got this movie and I'm getting hitched. We both had a good month, huh? Right. Yeah. The Better Call Saul reference. I love that. Yeah, oh, I love that. If you like pina coladas, getting caught in the rain. Better Call Saul was great. To watch TV and have people tell you that you went to high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, when you didn't? He went to school here? Yeah, I was class of 64, he still talks about it. He, he said, no, we're here to celebrate, you know, Rupert Holmes, he, he went to this school. And I'm, thinking, I'm saying, did I, did I? At one night, I'm watching Mystery Science Theater 3000, and Joel, who's on this rocket ship the, uh, uh, with these two robots, he starts they, explaining the pina colada song to them. And they don't even know that each other likes pina coladas? What, would they always panic and order Manhattans or something? Yeah. And it was kind of late at night, and I thought, okay, so am I hallucinating? Did I eat mushrooms for dinner? What? They're talking about me. It's on TV. Or am I thinking they're talking about me? I was watching Dead to Me with Christina Applegate the other night. She turns and says, I'm thinking of... Uh, you know, uh, taking a vacation, and uh, the, uh, the the her partner in crime says, uh, uh, "Oh, you mean like pina coladas?" She says, "Yeah, getting caught in the rain." And I think that's the third time Christina Applegate has acknowledged my song. She did it in, she sang it in um, the sweetest thing. If you like pina coladas, <laughs> get caught in, the- in one of her TV series, she comes out of a coma hearing it, and now she's plugging it in her new series. And I love Christina Applegate, so how bad is that? So I think that the reason why there there are 20 or 30 songs that are like this in all of pop culture from 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it's a certain song that takes you exactly to that moment in yeah. time that it came out. And yeah. there are just a few of those songs that do that. And Escape is one of those songs. It just places you in that moment. American yeah. Splendor is a great example of that because right when you hear it, it takes you to that timeline in that movie. Yeah, it's um, it's it's songs can catapult you. They are time travel. And sometimes even a song that you didn't like at the time, you now have fondness for because it makes you remember that summer, that spring, that girl, that guy, that. uh, 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 So anytime I hear We Can Work It Out by the Beatles. We can work it out. I am walking through 11 inches of snow in Syracuse, New York, in my carpet slippers. Now, I can no longer remember why I thought it was right to wear carpet slippers to walk in 11 inches of snow, but it, I am there. It just takes me there because that's it was a hit around that time, and I just it, those it, th- that time and that song are welded together in my brain. Music's the only thing that is readily available that can do that, and I hear Escape. And it takes me back. It, well, what's cool about it is I have like 15 memories of it now because I have my memory with my kids. 
my dad, I remember hearing that song in the car and he'd turn it up. Oh, here's your, your Pina Colada song. <laughs> so it's just cool to pass that on from generation to generation yeah. and have those moments with your own kids. I'm, I'm grateful for you acknowledging that that happens with music and your show does a lot of that, a lot of that. Oh, thank you. What is your favorite moment of all these years with this song? What stands out to you? It's, okay, honestly, it's been, my favorite moments have come in recent years where when I go into it, singing it for a live audience, I get a view that, that the audience doesn't get. They're looking at me. That's the bad news for them. The good news for, the good news for me is I'm looking at them. And when I go into the song, the audience's faces transform. They become, they suddenly slip 10, 20, 30 years of their age. They become, they become almost a little bit like, they get, a, they get a kind of silly smile on their face. I'm not making fun of them one bit. They, they kind of relax a little bit. They get, they get kind of, and, and I've, I've had this recently, and I've, you know, I, perform, I don't do much performing, but I'm good for any benefit. If there's any way that my singing that silly song uh, can earn money for or raise money for a cause, I'll do it. And so I get to perform it a lot for audiences. And funnily enough, what I love is that I get the same reaction from people in their mid-20s as people in their mid-50s. When I would present a song to Barbara Streisand, and I'd be at the piano, and she'd have it in front of her, and I'd play it for her, and then she'd sing it. As she started to sing it, I would almost go, because <laughs> it's Barbara Streisand singing my song. That's, diff that's different from me singing my song. It's like instantly, it has credibility. And I hear that voice I've been hearing all my life singing something I made up in my kitchen, and now that voice is being married to that creation of mine. And what I love is when I sing it, people hear, they, it's kind of like they go, <laughs> they've been, I've been singing all night, but if I go into that song, they go, oh, it's him. <laughs> it's that guy. It's like, and, and I almost feel as if they're saying, you know, I rode around with you in my convertible all summer one year. You know, you were with me. I didn't know that. So I think that's, I mean, that's an incredible um, feeling and experience, a super normal um, experience. Very few people get to have that experience of having instant recognition with strangers. And, and most of them, for most of them, it's affectionate. And you, you know, and, and as I get old, um, it's quite a wonderful thing to happen in my life. It really is. Yeah. So I, I, I could tell you lots of moments, you know, uh, um, but, but I think this overall experience of, of now singing it and it meaning something over the course of 40 years to literally millions of people uh, is an extraordinary uh, privilege and joy. Yes, I like you. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Rupert Holmes and this classic song. What do you remember about this song? It was one of the first songs I remember as a child. Do you consider it as a 70s song or as an 80s song? It'd be a fun discussion. If you like our videos, we do invite you to subscribe below to be a part of this community. To get the band shirt of the day that I'm wearing or other shirts I've worn, check out our links below, our Amazon links. Also, we're gonna link to, to Rupert Holmes' novel and uh, other things as well. Uh, and if you want, check us out on Patreon. We have more videos and more opportunities for you to see this, for to see more content. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe out there.